Welcome and thank you very much for coming. My name is Ellen Lindsay and I'm the principal here um, at AMSA. Um, as we run through the evening, you're going to get a chance to meet all of our department chairs, including Dr. Lewis, who's also our executive director. And um, let's see, first slide. Okay, here's my welcome slide. Just want to kind of give you an outline for the evening. So, as I mentioned, each one of our department chairs will spend some time talking about the curriculum um, that we're offering here at the high school level. There'll be a short period of time where you can ask questions, but I'm going to play timekeeper tonight. That's my job. And um, we're going to, about 10 minutes per, per subject, okay? Um, and then I may jump up and, and then we can do a few more questions at the end if you have it. But we really want to be tight on our time tonight for 7.30 to end the evening. Um, we're going to talk about graduation requirements. We're going to do those department overviews, uh, AMSA athletics, the course selection process, um, and some college planning information. So there's an AMSA graduate quote here, AMSA does more than teach subjects, AMSA taught me how to think, how to take a problem and make it simple to solve. I think that's one of the things that we do best, we help students to become independent learners and to be able to come pro become creative problem solvers. So just taking a look, oh this didn't, uh, sorry about that, that um, seemed to change. Um, um, it doesn't look great, but anyway, sorry about that. Just to give, kind of give you an idea, we tell um, students who become ninth graders here at AMSA, is, you know, like a high school transcript now, as you know, is created from, from that point on. And so we also have graduation requirements that go along a credit system. Each one of the department shows will talk about this, but there's six credits of math that they'll take before they graduate. Four credits of English, that's one English class each year. We also have electives in each of those, and they'll talk to you about that. Three years of science, three years of history, one and a half um, credits of computer science. Some of the computer science classes you'll hear are one credit, some of them are half a credit. They don't need one and a half years, they need one and a half credits. Um, there's two credits, um, two years of the same world language, consecutive world language. Colleges really like to see three or four. So that's your goal, but this is the minimum required for graduation, also minimum required for the state of Massachusetts. We have 1.75 um, credits of physical education and health. They have health in 10th grade. This other quarter of a credit is uh, for senior year. They have a senior seminar with the school counselors. So that's where that little quarter of credit comes from. One credit of fine arts. That's two, cre uh, two classes because they're every other day. And for total credits of 28. The kids typically take between seven and eight credits each year. Um, and Kate's going to talk about that a little bit more. Also, as part of our graduation requirement, state requirement, we have ninth grade biology, and we in 10th grade we have math and English MCAS. Alrighty, so we have three different levels of courses here at AMSA. This is pretty typical of what you see in a high school. Um, we have a CP level, which is college preparatory, um, and this. The, these are the classes that our students need to get into college. These are the ones that they're looking for, um, at, especially at, at the state schools. Um, but they certainly, at the level that AMSA teaches them, um, will help support them and have them ready for college. We have our honors levels courses. And these courses are much more complex. They're going into things at a deeper level. The pacing is, is often much faster. And then we have advanced placement um, AP, college board, um, the college courses that we have. We have 18 AP classes for next year, and the chairs will talk about, about that also. Um, one thing to, that we've added, uh, uh, two, I guess it's two years now, is when you look onto the AMSA website, you're going to see a course of study catalog. We've added um, average homework that's going to be expected from each one of those levels. So when you start talking to your children about which classes to pick, you may want to look, okay, on average, this class at a CP level is X number of minutes per week for homework, as opposed to the honors level. It's something that's worth taking a look at. And I am going to introduce to you our math department chair, Ms. Luber Schmidt. And I'm going to ask them to not vacuum while we're eating. One second. Luba. Departments, courses, 
that we offer in high school. Um, everybody is studying algebra, geometry, and pre-calculus. Uh, we study geometry and parallel to algebra, so uh, several classes um, you see here and they differ uh, by pace and by depth. Uh, pace, uh, by, uh, when we are talking about that they differ by pace, that's true for all of them. When we are talking that these paths are, these, these paths differ by um, depth, it's not necessarily that courses in the higher uh, level are in more depth than courses in honors level or something like that because sometimes uh, because the pace is more the pace is quicker we can actually uh, cannot go in the depth that we want to go and we actually we will be able to do it in this level but maybe not able to do it in this level just have it in mind but nevertheless uh, we give students more time um, to work with material on the left part of this <laughs> levels and uh, like I said the pace is quicker here so geometry is studying uh, students studying geometry in ninth and tenth grade uh, for all levels but the highest level the highest level studying geometry and finishing geometry uh, the whole geometry course in ninth grade so like I said uh, well, for some of this uh, level, we actually can go deeper because they are not as rapid as other ones. Um, so everybody studying, like I said, everybody studying geometry, algebra, and pre-calculus, and majority of our students studying calculus, and we strongly believe that uh, this is something that we uh, can and should do because calculus describes uh, the world around us and it's good that majority of our students introduced at least to some ideas of calculus um, Some of them introduced uh, to these ideas into formal calculus courses into AP calculus courses some of them introduced to this idea in, in the intro to calculus courses uh, We have several um, electives in 12th grade, uh, like uh, AP Calculus, AP Statistics, uh, Honor Statistics, Multivariable Calculus, Linear Algebra. One of the most uh, popular course is Accounting and Business Fundamentals. And we always have students struggle for this course because this is actually a really good course. I wish I could take it. Uh, so um, students are moving uh, diagonally in this table. So uh, in entrance point is where uh, your students is now and what will be recommendation of his eighth grade math teacher. But uh, after that, some students moving from this corner to this corner during the high school career. Some students, vice versa, thinking that they have enough uh, pressure and choosing uh, less advanced course. And it is perfectly okay with us uh, both passes, you know, diagonally this way and diagonally that way is okay with us. Uh, so sometimes you need to take uh, students need to uh, study a little bit during summer um, to jump if they want to jump uh, for example from <coughs> uh, algebra to CP level to pre-calculus honors or from pre-calculus honors to uh, AB calculus or BC calculus in 11th grade they need to study during summer uh, but we have students successfully moving uh, if they want to challenge themselves. Most of the time uh, they are able to do that and we support that because we want them to challenge themselves. Um, any questions? 
More questions? Yeah. So just to confirm, the eighth grade teachers will place them where they're starting or the kids or the kids are choosing? Is no, kids are not choosing uh, the entrance point. Uh, teachers, are, okay. teachers are recommending uh, for, for the ninth grade uh, math. Any other questions? Thank you so much. English. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Um, right, so uh, the English department is generally organized so that we mirror the history department's curriculum. Um, you may have noticed that your students, if they've been here since sixth grade, it started in a historical fashion, so chronologically through six and through seven and through eight. We try to do the same thing with nine through 12, um, but it becomes a little tricky and restrictive. Um, so for some of the texts you'll see, you'll come across that they're not historically the same, but they are topically the same. So for example, when they're studying a particular kind of civil war somewhere, we might take that theme of civil war and then pick a similar civil strife based novel. So it's kind of a, more of a mixture. It gives us more scope to choose the best kind of literature that we can. Um, so, from here on in, um, you can see that we do cover the European um, and the kind of historical faction, uh, factors there, but you will also find in there some kind of anomalies, some more modern texts. Um, for example, we've got Lord of the Flies, um, which really isn't European Renaissance era, it's 1950s, um, but we do that so that they can talk about how a society crumbles in the same way that it does in the history that they're learning. So as they go through 9 and 10 and 11, um, all students have to take one full credit course of English and through 9 and 10 those are core so all students will either do CP or they will do honours versions of the core of that. Um, when they get into 11 they actually then can start deciding whether they want to replace either of those with an AP and we've now split it so that in grade 11 they can do AP Lit and then in um, 12 they can do AP Language um, and we did that so that we can have an even split of numbers um, so maybe think ahead, if, if AP is something that you want to do, maybe consider that you need to sort out that one is in 11 and one is 12 for your planning. We also have several electives that are available to ninth graders, and you can see those right here. On the right hand side, these are the three that are available for next year, so should you wish to do them. We have creative writing, we have journalism, and then we have lit to film. So of those, creative writing and journalism um, are every other day. But Lit to Film is a full credit course because there's far too much to fit in, says Mr. Smith, um, in order to be able to see all those movies and read all those books. Um, so that meets every day. That's a full credit course. And then you can see um, beyond that what's available in terms of 10 through 12 electives there at the bottom. Philosophy, Surviving the Apocalypse. Pretty excited about this one. That's a crossover with history and with science. Um, and then we also have Writing Centre Tutors for 10 through 12. So this is a new initiative. We'd like to get some of our skilled older students to help the younger students with their writing projects in the school. Um, so that, that really is a simple run through of the English department. Are there any questions? Yes? Um, do the electives like, replace the ELA class? Like how we have to do the ELA class? Do the electives replace that? That's a good question. So she's asking um, if you take a, a core ELA class like everyone else, can you replace it with an elective? Those are all additional. They're all additional, yeah. Um, the only thing that, w uh, that really makes a difference is down when you do AP, those replace the core in 11 and 12. Those are not considered electives in English. Any other questions? Yeah. How likely is it for a ninth grader to get into a creative writing or a journalism class? Will we do this? So um, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but generally speaking, if it's oversubscribed, then we favour the seniors first. We place the seniors first. Um, but in English, we, that has not ever happened to us. What we would always try to do, and that that sounded like I was saying, my, nobody wants to do my subject. That's not what I meant. Uh, not what I meant at all. Uh, but what what we try to do is, if we find something is oversubscribed and popular, then we just make more classes and make more teachers available to teach those classes. So that's what, that's what I meant. So it's very, very unlikely that if you want to be a journalist, I'm pretty sure we can ensure that Mr. Smith has you as a journalist. He would love that. Any other questions? Okay, wonderful. Oh, wait, yep. Um, so for like journalism or something like that, um, and they, let's say they were to take that as a freshman, would they be able to do that? Or would they have to do it 
can they repeat that elective? Like, is that something that they're really passionate? Can they repeat that elective over here? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the question was, can you repeat an elective? And with journalism, yes, you can. Uh, a lot of people choose to do that because they then become editors and kind of rise through the ranks of the production. Um, so Mr. Smith does encourage you to take it more than one time. Yeah. Yes, at the back. Will there be a recommendation from the eighth grade teacher on the best suitors? Yep. So with all courses, that's right, all courses, even electives, right? That there's a recommendation process and we click yes, we, we go. Okay, um, Ms. Driver is going to tell you all about that in a more informed way. Any other questions? Wonderful, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna to talk to you quickly about science and computer science. So your students are going to take biology next year because they're gonna get the biology MCAS, we're gonna get it over with in the ninth grade because you have, in the 10th grade, you'll have ELA and math to deal with so we're not gonna do a triple painful uh, episode for you there. But you'll have two levels to, uh, to, to choose from. You'll have uh, CP and you'll have honors. 10th grade, you'll go to chemistry. You'll have CP and honors. In 10th grade, you'll also have the availability to take AP Biology. AP Biology, AP Chemistry, and AP Physics will not count as a graduation requirement. You have to take Biology, Chemistry, and Physics at either the CP or Honors level. Okay? Just going to throw that one out there so we don't get anyone saying, my kid has to take AP Bio in the ninth grade. It's not possible. So after you get all the way to 11th grade, we have a lot of electives that open up. This year we have meteorology, which is a new one we're running for the very first time. We also, we're toying with the idea of bringing back forensic science. It really hasn't been that popular. It was popular years ago. So now we're just trying to cycle through electives. And by the time your students get to 11th, 12th grade, we may have it back. <coughs> We also have environmental sustainability, which seems to be a very powerful elective. And I think this year we're going to try and run a, what are we calling that? We kicked around like five different names. Basically, we wanted to call it the natural history of biology, but we didn't want to use the word history in there because it might confuse students. But basically it's the study of biology but not a biology course. It's the how biology came to be in the kingdoms, the phylums, and, and all that. And Ms. Tivo is going to be very excited about teaching that. I'm sure your children will have her at one point or another. Um, also, anatomy and physiology seems to be a ridiculously popular elective. Don't know why. I personally do not like that, but uh, the students seem to really love that. And if you're going pre-med, highly recommend going for that one. So we're going to switch slides here, and we're going to cover CS, and then we'll open it up to questions on both. So computer science. You have to either choose between intro to Java or web design for next year. From there, it opens up dramatically. You can do intro to CAD, advanced web, or APCS. Then once you get after APCS, typically we find the students that really want to do computer science will take APCS. The electives open up dramatically. We have some of the hot, the, I think the more amazing ones are cybersecurity. We're doing a data science class and we've got a discrete math computer science thing going on that we co-teach with our math department. Two of our most advanced teachers teach that. But you have to get through APCS. This is, these are courses for those true die hard, I love this stuff, I want to do it potentially as a career sort of students. The rest of the, the uh, student body has a bunch of other choices that uh, they can take. We also offer a digital media class that we are running in coordination, co-taught, with our art department. And that's an interesting uh, class. It literally is what it is, digital media. But it also could serve as 
fulfilling either an art requirement or a computer science requirement. We wanted to open that up because a lot of times students get to 11th grade or 12th grade and they either need a CS or they need an art and we wanted to make sure that they could fulfill both if, if they had a choice. So questions? Yes? I have a couple. One, if they can't take those electives till 11 or 12. Yes and no. <laughs> no, because they never have the time. Yes, if they meet the prereqs. And the other question is, what happens if they possibly don't have the biology MCAT? That, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> I've been here now, what was it, 14 years now? 13 years? This is our 14. 14. We've had one. We work. That's my daughter. What happened? <laughs> we work diligently and offer. So, first of all, you, you've got to ignore everything that we're doing. Because in late March, we offer a, or an after school boot camp hour and a half every week for like eight weeks. It's free of charge. The answer pays for the teacher. We run through all the biology MCAS questions and we test your students. We see where their weaknesses are and we throw them up. The student who didn't pass did not attend. And we will give out invitations to those students we feel that could benefit the most for it. But it's open to anybody. <coughs> but most, honestly, most of them don't need it. And y you, will, you will know mm -hmm. long before <coughs> that your son or daughter is in, failure, in, in jeopardy of failing. But you really have to ignore everything we're doing, not attend anything <coughs> to have it. But if you do happen to not pass, then we will work diligently to get your son or daughter to pass. And if they cannot pass successively, then we can put in for it's some kind of a portfolio program which we've done for other things. So it's not an end of the line. Other questions, comments, concerns? Research. Oh yeah, 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 I forgot about that. Didn't have a slide. Let me answer this question first. Um, so similar to the question I asked before, is it like intro to Java and um, intro to web design? Do those replace the classes or is there like separate computer science CP? That, that's a great question. So computer science is touch different. I'm wanting, <laughs> I want you to get excited about computer science. So any single one of these classes fulfills a requirement. We're not saying you have to take just this or that. They will fulfill a requirement, all of them will. Okay, in science, one minute, sir. In science, we do have a research program. It starts in the 10th grade. It is, if you know anything about graduate research in science, that's exactly what it is. We modeled a, a research program in high school that works just like a graduate research program. You don't end up with a master's or a doctorate with from this at all, but what ends up happening is you gain extremely valuable lab experience in working on a project, and they get a tremendous amount of experience presenting in the public their scientific findings. And ideally, we'd like students to come in in the 10th grade, stay with it for 11th and 12th. We have had ridiculous luck getting those students into whatever college they seem to want to get into because they're different. We're the only school in the nation that offers a research program. So I encourage your students to do it. We offer research in molecular biology, in wildlife management, which is more of going out in the woods and seeing what's there and scientifically documenting it. We have a geochemistry which is looking at soils and what's in the soils. And then we have an engineering research. So those are the research 
opportunities that will be available starting the 10th grade. We do give them in, tenth, in the ninth grade, we do give them the test to make sure that their aptitude is actually what they're, what they're gonna be uh, selecting. Because you may want to do wildlife management, but if you do not like to be out in the woods and be wet and cold, that may not be the place for you. Okay, sir, you had a question. Ninth grade, you can enter Java and enter the website either or, or is it both of those? Either or. So if you don't take Java in ninth grade, you can't take it in any other point? Oh, no, you can take it. Intro to Java and Intro to Web are available any year. So you could, in fact, take Intro to Java, Intro to Web, and Intro to CAD, and then be done with CS and say, I never want to touch it again. Or you can choose one and move forward. I heard that there was intro to CAD in ninth grade this year, and this was moved to tenth grade, so there's no option taking intro to CAD in ninth grade. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Oh, <clears throat> uh, this year we had tried something new. We opened up intro to CAD in the ninth grade, and the question was, <laughs> we do not have that going forward. And the answer is yes, that's correct. We do not have that going forward. It wasn't the success we were hoping for. Okay. Next question is Dr. Lewis. Can everybody hear me in the back? <laughs> Yay. Excellent. Um, uh, but before I start with history, just thank you all for coming uh, tonight. It's kind of cold. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. Uh, thanks to all of our fantastic department chairs for coming and to Mr. Finkel, the amazing Mr. Finkel, for everything uh, that he does. Um, so, uh, history. In history, we have, uh, just to kind of give you a big kind of overview, we have uh, several really important goals. One really important goal that we have in history is to light the spark of history and to hopefully, uh, through our history classes, uh, to foster a lifelong love of history uh, so that uh, after your kids graduate, move on, uh, they'll want to major in history. Uh, and they will want to go teach history. Uh, or at the very least, they will continue to read and explore uh, the world of history. And related to that goal is the goal of making good citizens. Um, democratic society, all societies, rest on the abilities of their citizens to be well informed, to make good decisions, to know right from wrong, to know truth from fiction. Um, uh, it's important today, it was important 100 years ago, it will be, uh, will be important 100 years from now. Um, and uh, all of the history teachers believe that that's one of our fundamental goals, is to help uh, our students become uh, well-informed citizens. So, uh, how do we do that? Uh, at the high school level, um, our, all kids have to have uh, three credits in history, uh, which they will uh, almost all the time taken 9, 10, and 11. Um, our ninth grade curriculum uh, builds upon our 6 through 8 curriculum. So our 6 through 8 curriculum is taught, uh, it's generally chronological, so it begins with um, the, the first human beings, uh, Homo sapiens, and it goes all the way to the Greeks and the Romans and the Israelites and the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians and on into the Middle Ages and then early modern period, and then you get to ninth grade, so it goes very chronologically, and then in ninth grade, uh, it's the history of the world from uh, pretty much the end of the French Revolution uh, to um, the present day. Uh, so, um, um, covers uh, Europe, uh, covers uh, Asia, uh, the Middle East, uh, Africa, South America. Uh, and then on into ninth, so uh, tenth and eleventh grade, uh, we introduced two years of U.S. history. We changed that a couple of years ago. All of the teachers in the history department felt that we, we previously had had one year of U.S. history, and we felt that to really do uh, U.S. history justice, we needed two years. So we broke it uh, into two uh, halves, uh, which is pretty much what most other high schools do. So our 10th uh, grade U.S. history curriculum goes from 1491, or 1490, 1491, the key year there, of course, is that it doesn't begin to 1492. We want to talk about uh, North and South America before the arrival of Columbus. There were people uh, there. There were large civilizations there. 
Uh, so it goes from 1491 uh, all the way up to about 18, 1877, uh, after the Civil War into the period of Reconstruction. Um, and then the 11th grade class goes from uh, Reconstruction all the way up to uh, the present day. Um, uh, and as with all the other subjects, we have three levels. We have the college, uh, college prep, honors, and advanced uh, placement. We have a nice uh, selection, I hope, of advanced placement uh, classes ranging from uh, European history, um, which is taught by Mr. Prude, a fantastic uh, teacher, AP Macroeconomics, taught by uh, Ms. Bowen, who has told me that she now wants to be an economics teacher and not a history teacher, because she has fallen in love with the topic. Um, uh, and then we have AP U.S. History, uh, which is uh, being taught by uh, another fantastic history teacher, Ms. Murphy. Uh, and AP Psychology, which, um, despite my pleading, was not in the curriculum last year. Uh, I mean, I said, this lady, we've got to have AP Psychology. And she said, no, it's not important. <laughs> the conversation actually was very opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it back. I've won. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I convinced Ms. Lindsay that it is important. My wife is a psychologist, so, you know. Yeah, I know. Uh, so we put, <laughs> uh, we, we put it back in, uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a huge demand for AP uh, psychology. And it's a great class. We've had it before. Um, and so we're really happy to have that back, and we're, we're confident it will be very popular. Um, then we have a couple of electives there. Um, for the first time, we're, in addition to an AP Mac or Economics, we'll be offering uh, an intro to economics, uh, also which will be taught by uh, Ms. Bowen. Uh, economics is a very important topic, um, uh, and understanding the basic terms of economics and business is something that we just cannot leave to just AP. Everybody uh, should have an introduction to economics that we should uh, provide them. Uh, Ms. Murphy teaches a citizenship class as an elective to introduce uh, students to the basic uh, foundations of American government, uh, ideals of American society, the most important documents, um, the different branches of the federal government. Uh, uh, Mr. Rueck teaches a fantastic uh, criminology course where uh, students, uh, also very, very popular students, learn all about various types of crime, motivations behind crime, white collar crime, blue collar crime, um, way crime is uh, studied and analyzed and whatnot. Very exciting uh, class. Um, and then uh, for the first time, we are teaching a course in modern Africa. Uh, Mr. Pru will be teaching that elective. Um, we have a really strong history curriculum. One of the things that we've been working on in the history curriculum is to broaden its focus and its origins. Several, uh, 15 years ago and its origins, the uh, history curriculum was very strongly Eurocentric. Uh, European history is very important, no doubt about it, but so too is the history of Africa, so too is the history of Asia, so too is the his history of South America. So we really wanted to broaden our focus. We have a lot more to do with that, and we want to do, but this is an important start, and we're looking forward to starting it with a uh, history of modern Africa. Uh, we also have an elective called Hate. It uh, sounds very disturbing, um, but it is important. Uh, hate is a, just pick up the newspaper. Who picks up the newspaper? Nobody picks up the newspaper. <laughs> Click on the uh, internet on your cell phone, and you see hate, hate, hate is everywhere, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so this is going to be a course that's really designed to explore the topic of hate. It will, it will be uh, an uncomfortable course, no doubt, but it is designed to explore what is uncomfortable uh, so that uh, we can hopefully develop within our students an understanding of some of the dark side of dark sides of American history as it comes to the history of race, the history of immigrants in our country, uh, so that they can develop a deep and rich understanding of aspects of American history that are not always uh, particularly rosy. Um, and then, last but not least, Ms. Waldron met, mentioned this too, uh, Surviving the Apocalypse. And, and frankly, of all the courses that we will teach at AMSA, including the Math Science, uh, English Foreign Language Department, Surviving the Apocalypse, what, what has to be truly the most important class. Um, so, uh, all joking aside, so that's a course that's going to look at several apocalyptic scenarios 
and how these apocalyptic, apocalyptic scenarios are treated uh, in the world of literature, uh, have been treated uh, in uh, history, uh, and uh, how science interrelates, interacts with these apocalyptic scenarios. So we'll be looking at things like uh, great diseases through history, um, uh, moments of uh, nuclear annihilation, um, you know, wonderful, uplisting things like that. Um, uh, so it actually should be a very, very interesting interdisciplinary uh, course that we're all really excited uh, to teach. So that was a quick overview of history. Uh, any questions? Yeah, so the way I read that, so in grade 12, there is no specific core Correct. class. It's electives yes. only yes. as they need to meet their, yes. their points. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. So do we have to take history for the whole, whole, like the rest of high school or only three years? Three years, yeah. But you'll want four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so trust me, you'll want four. You might say, oh, geez, I don't so know, that's a lot. You, 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 you'll, you'll be like, we have five. <laughs> Let's take away from some of the other people. Yes? Um, so, unlike science, I'm assuming that your AP is still a core. Is what? If yes, AP yes. Is still a yep. core, the, the history uh, yes. is. So if you, if you want to take, uh, if you take AP US history, you are entitled to, um, to not take grade 11 <coughs> US history. Right. So you'll you'll still take grade ten U.S. history, but if you if you're in grade eleven and you desire to take AP U.S. history, you will not need to take um, grade eleven. So my question was like the AP macroeconomics or AP that, European that history. Is, no, that wouldn't substitute for the history. It wouldn't. It would not. No. It would not. Okay. Just just the history course. What about AP European history? That would substitute for grade ten. <clears throat> so that, that's sort of no, no, it does not. <laughs> <talk to people. laughs> Those are electives. The only one is so the kids are taking world history ninth grade. They're taking U.S. history one in ten. In eleventh is the only place where they're either taking U.S. history two or they're take, taking U.S. AP U.S. history. The rest of the AP class are all electives. Yeah. Any other questions about history? Excellent. Uh, I think Ms. Preston with four letters. And heart. Yes. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. So, starting with the world languages, um, students can decide if they want to continue on with Latin uh, next year. Uh, or if they want to begin to take either French or Spanish. Uh, and we offer AP for all three languages. So I'll just kind of take you uh, through each language at a time. For students who choose to continue on with Latin, they would be taking Latin two next year. And that would be combi combined of CP and honors. We would have either one section or uh, two sections, depending on the number of students. but that would be uh, combined levels in, in the course. And um, then their sophomore year, uh, they would either, um, you know, they would take either Latin 3 CP or honors. The honors level is uh, focus on poetry. And um, again, that may be a com combined levels course. Certainly, students can, can switch from CP to honors, honors and vice versa. You know, it's not like they're locked into it the, the whole time. Particularly if the, the levels are combined, it makes it easy for the schedule, right? They don't have to fix their schedule, they're already in that, that section. Uh, then uh, junior year, we have uh, Latin four. The honors is, uh, looks at prose. And then their senior year, they can take either Latin five uh, which is a combination of CP and honors or AP Latin. And I will say that um, while we have a smaller group of students that elect to take Latin than Spanish, for example, the vast majority, we have a really strong group of students that continue on with Latin until their senior year with AP. It's, it's really quite impressive. So, um, and we also have a, an extremely active Latin club, JCL, and Mr. Bakla is our, our high school line teacher, and he just does a phenomenal job. So, 
Um, so students can also decide to take either French or Spanish, and those are similar um, levels that you'll see. So uh, ninth grade, they would either be doing French one or Spanish one. Uh, I should mention also that we do have it uh, sometimes students who are coming in from other schools who maybe have already taken either French or Spanish, and they could do a placement test to determine if maybe level two would be a better fit for them. So that, um, you know, I, we, we have that uh, every year now, we have at least a handful of students who are um, ninth graders in a level two French or Spanish class. So that, that is also a possibility. And um, so then their, their sophomore year, they would either be placed in uh, the CP or the honors class. Um, so French, similarly to Latin, is generally uh, CP and honors combined. And of course, obviously, uh, that the, the two different levels would be differentiated and different assessments and, and such. But those are generally mixed into one class. Uh, our French teacher is Madame Zogro, who's amazing. We also have a French club. And uh, for Spanish, the, the CP and the honors classes are separated because we have uh, enough students that's usually our, our most popular language. So we generally have about four sections um, of Spanish offered uh, beginning in level one. And uh, again, so 11th grade, they could either, uh, they could move up from CP to honors or they could decide, uh, and with teacher recommendation, that maybe they could decide that CP would be a better mix, a better uh, match for them. Um, but if they do want to take AP, either French or Spanish their senior year, they do uh, need to do the prerequisite of the honors course. So it would be either French three honors or Spanish three honors uh, prior to doing, to doing AP. So that is something that they should just be mindful of if that's something that they're really um, passionate about doing. Their, their senior year is, um, we do look for the, the honors course prior to that. Um, certainly we, with, with these classes, we like to study not just the language, but the culture. Uh, so for, for Spanish, uh, we look at the cultures from, from many uh, Spanish speaking countries. And the, um, the alternative to AP, which is uh, French for and Spanish for, that's really a, a film and culture class. So that looks um, closely at, um, we'll study the historical and cultural context um, prior to watching the movie and then analyze uh, the movie. So that's a really interesting uh, course as well. Um, and I should mention, I know that Ms. Lindsay uh, mentioned this, but just to reiterate, although students are only required to take two years of a world language, most colleges recommend three, and the vast majority of our students take at least three years of a consecutive language. Um, and we also have a, a, a large number that, that continue on with the fourth year. Um, so if for an elective next year, we are very excited to offer Introduction to Mandarin. And that this is a new course that we're going to be rolling out uh, at first to juniors and seniors as an elective because it's, it's a sort of a big undertaking to offer a new language. We want to go about it. Um, thoughtfully and then over time you know we can look into building that if the, the interest is there uh, that it is important to note that that is an, an elective so it does not fulfill their their world language requirement um, and so it would be advisable for for students to continue on again if a college is looking for three years of a world language they're looking for three years consecutive of the same, the same language, so they would want to continue on with either French, Latin, or Spanish, but if it also fits into their schedule, they could take uh, Introduction to Mandarin as an elective. Um, so I guess that's that. I just wanted to mention also um, that we have, uh, so we've got an, a trip to Spain this February, led by EF Education and uh, Mr. Fuller, and then next um, February there's going to be a service trip that we're hoping to do to the Dominican Republic, and also uh, a trip to Quebec next uh, April for our French program. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Yeah? Um, 
So if, if a student takes the course and goes all the way through and takes the AP course in the various language, mm -hmm. does that, if they take the AP course and pass the AP test, does that meet their college language requirement? It does for, I don't know for every single college, I think usually it's I think like a four and up, is that right, it, Ms. Driver? Yeah, right. It depends wholly on the school. Okay. On the college. But it's this, is it any different regardless of which language you take, whether it's Latin, Spanish, or Typically, French? Yes. All right, so um, moving on to art, and then I can take questions about, about both. So um, first of all, I don't know if anyone was able to come to Arts Night last Wednesday, last week, but we hosted our Winter Arts Night, which was a celebration of our performing and visual arts here. And that was really awesome. And we have a spring arts night uh, coming out May 16th. So we offer a number of electives in fine arts. Students can do chorus, which they can do two years. They could do the, they could repeat that, and that could fulfill their requirement. And then we have um, a whole range of courses that they can choose from. They could do Western <laughs> art masterpieces, which is largely um, an art history course. That's um, Usually, Miss Cloutman who teaches that is phenomenal. We also have drawing and painting, which is the prerequisite for AP. So students that are really looking um, at fine arts and, and, and really interested in that and doing AP, it's highly recommended that they do drawing and painting. 3D art um, and printmaking. I should say printmaking, multicultural art, and myth and art. Generally, those are courses that we uh, offer every other year just to give course, to give students more options. And so um, next year we'll be offering multicultural art but not printmaking, and myth and art will be a new course for next year as well. Um, digital media, as Dr. Dre mentioned, that is co-taught by a computer science and a fine arts teacher, and it is very popular. And that is open to juniors and seniors. And then AP Studio Art would be the one art course that is one full credit they meet every day. And that is, uh, you need to have a recommendation from an art teacher to, uh, to take that class. And it was amazing to see their, their artwork on display uh, at Arts Night last week. It just really blew me away. Um, and then I should also add yearbook. <laughs> that is now in the fine arts uh, department, and so um, it will not fulfill your fine arts requirement, but certainly that could be taken as an elective for students who are, who are interested in doing that. So, I don't know if you have any questions about anything? No? All right, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm obviously not Pete Jones, um, but Pete Jones is our athletic director, and I don't know, you might have seen in one of our newsletters recently that uh, Pete was actually honored by um, the Massachusetts Athletic Directors Association recently, so we're very proud of, um, of Pete and, and what a great job he does representing AMSA when he's out in the community, as all of our, our teachers do. Uh, but anyway, Pete's home with a, with a newborn baby boy, and so um, I'm gonna jump in here. And I was thinking that as we were talking about athletics, which makes me think of sports, which makes me think of football, which makes me think of the Patriots, I, I just wanted to um, just celebrate just for a moment for that incredible win that we had. Uh, because we are so proud of our teams here in Massachusetts. <laughs> baseball. We also offer baseball here at AMSA. And we do have official AMSA sporting teams, both the Patriots and the Red Sox, um, New England teams. So anyway, I'm, I'm not Pete Jones, but I do love sports and athletics, and we have a great program here for our kids. Um, and you can see there, all we are competing in Division 2, 3, 4 through the Colonial Athletic League. Probably some of your students have been involved in sports in eighth grade or, or younger. Um, but these are some of the, the varsity um, teams that we wrestle off. And this soccer, cross country, volley, girls volleyball, golf, basketball, wrestling, hockey, indoor, outdoor, track and field, baseball, softball, lacrosse, tennis, and football. And um, as you probably know, like for football, we, we join in with, um, with Maynard 
and the same thing with some of our other our other sports and if you have any questions please reach out to Pete um, he'll be happy to help you with any questions you might have um, he also at this part um, point in the um, program talks a lot about the importance of grades and um, and discipline for our athletes our student athletes because there are um, the MIA rules but actually AMSA's um, policies hold our students to a higher standard and I know we're always so proud to to um, get reports back from we've had other schools call and say just want to let you know we ran against your your girls um, wow what a, what a team what a nice group of kids and so we hear things about that I've gotten calls actually about Pete Jones um, and what a great job he does with our kids out on the road so um, so we run a very tight athletic program the grades um, and, and he has an athletic handbook that you can look at, but the grades standards are higher than even the MIA um, hold the students to. And um, our students are out oftentimes doing community service. I know Mark Vital does a lot with his track teams. Um, and so if you have any questions about that, there are, and, and it's not a flexible thing. If the grades are lower than they, where they need to be, the kids will sit out until those grades are, are brought up. And now I'm going to turn the time over to Kate Driver for all our information about school counseling. All right, so logistics. Um, the counselors, Ms. Lociavo, who I imagine most of you have spoken to at some point, um, and Ms. Culhane, who works with some of our upper school students, met with all students through their English classes over the last couple of weeks. Um, they talked about the general course selection process and how to actually access the form for students, which is in Plus Portals. There's, when the students go in, there's a little um, tab that now appears that says first request, they click on that, they click on the form, and then they can start filling in their choices. Um, they are required to submit that course request form by February 1st. Uh, Ms. Lociavo has opened up her schedule and students have been able to sign up for individual appointments to ask her questions, and I know she's met with a fair amount of students already and is gonna continue to do that over the next two weeks to make sure that students have the info that they need and have had some uh, someone look over their course request in addition to you all at home. Um, she is also, she's certainly available if you have questions. Um, I brought cards in case you have questions for me. Um, but teachers will either approve or deny the course requests um, for math, uh, English, biology, and history especially. Um, I believe world language as well should probably be added to that. Um, anyway, so right now teachers are continuing to talk with their classes both in the large group and then sometimes individually about what courses the students should be signing up for. Um, we've tweaked this a little bit from some of um, what was done last year because we felt like we really wanted to have teachers have access to semester grades before they had to uh, make their final recommendations. Last year when they put in recommendations, it was really early and so there was definitely a lot of movement, there was some confusion for kids. And so this year, we're asking them to be proactive and help make recommendations to the kids, you know, verbally, and then the kids select their course. And then after that, those course requests will go back to teachers and teachers will be looking over everything and then approving, um, denying, moving, discussing, etc., to make sure that those that all the students are placed um, in the right courses, so that they're really successful next year. Um, we will definitely reach out to you too if we have you know big time questions or concerns, and you're welcome to get in touch with us if you have questions about specific levels that your students are eventually um, recommended for. Their current teacher is the best place to start because they know why they're there or why that was recommended if it's um, you know, possibly lack of homework completion and so hey yeah honors is going to be really tough if you're not turning in your work um, so those discussions are going to be happening over the next couple weeks and, and even into the beginning of February. Um, students need to take a minimum of seven credits but we recommend seven and a half in ninth grade. Um, we'll look at a sample schedule in just a moment so that you can get an idea of that. Um, we strongly, strongly recommend that students take an art or chorus class in grade nine and that they also start their computer science requirements. So essentially they need two half credit courses in art and three half credit courses 
in CS. We find that by the time students are entering their junior and senior year, there are lots of things that they've been waiting for that they're really, really, really excited to take. And it's a bummer when they have to take an elective, or pardon me, a course that meets a requirement that they're perhaps less excited about but have been putting off for a couple of years. And then they run into that conflict senior year because they have to take something to graduate. So we really recommend that they work on getting those graduation requirements finished up in their ninth, 10th, and 11th grade year so that they have more opportunity to take the courses that they would like their senior year. Um, students, if they have seven credits, they'll have a study hall every day, a half credit, or pardon me, um, one block study hall every day. If students have seven and a half credits, they'll have study hall every other day. We don't recommend the students take eight credits. You know, some students say, I really like to do my homework at home. I don't want to do it at school. But this is the first time that they will have not had a DS, a directed study. And for a lot of kids, that is an adjustment, even if they think it's not going to be. Um, and we also find that even if a student decides not to do their schoolwork, the downtime is nice during their school day to have at least one block every other day that they know that they're not going to be assigned more homework, that they can possibly take out a book and read it for pleasure. Um, so we think that's really important. Going for eight blocks each day is a lot. Um, we also recommend that students consider the prerequisites for the courses that they'd like to eventually take. So for example, if you look in our program of studies, if you want to take, hopefully I'm using the right example, if you want to take APCS as a sophomore or perhaps a junior, you need to have taken um, Intro to Java first. That's a prerequisite. It's important to think ahead. So you kind of want to look at where the students are hoping to go and plan backwards. We also really recommend, and for those of you who we may have seen at Coffee with the Counselors, that as students are choosing course levels, it's important to think about how they want to spend their time. It's not necessary to take honors everything or AP everything if that's not what they want to be doing. They need to think about the work that they're going to have outside of school and make sure that they're doing the work that feels most valuable to them. So when students say, well, should I take honors this and CP that, I'm not sure what's gonna look the best. It's important to think about what they have going on outside of school, how they wanna be spending their time, and what's their capacity to do the work in the hours that they have left after they get home from sports and hopefully get to still have dinner with you all. So we encourage choices and balance. Um, so this is a sample of um, a seven and a half credit student schedule. So again, most of this hopefully lines up with what you've just heard. French one, PE, then students, the student opted to take Java and art class, and that puts them at seven and a half credits, okay? So this is pretty typical for a ninth grade schedule. Um, a mix of honors and CP, and then working on those other requirements. Any questions about that schedule? All right. So lastly, just a quick um, plug for our department, because I, I am department chair as well. We work with students a lot in high school to get them ready to eventually apply to college. Um, we won't spend much time on this tonight, but we do work with a system called Naviance in grades 9 and 10. Students take um, some career and interest inventories. They do some resume work through that program. In 11th grade, starting in the spring, we offer a junior seminar that helps students get ready to apply to college. Um, they develop their college list, they get a decent start on um, possibly writing their college essay. And then in grade 12, we have a senior seminar that meets twice out of this uh, the eight day cycle where they work with us on getting their applications done. And those are taught by the counselors. We actually had our last senior seminar today, Tier. Um, <laughs> We do offer a junior parent night in the winter, a fall financial aid night um, in grade 12. So there's a lot of things that you'll see coming from our department. And then um, Ms. Lindsay also mentioned, and I think someone up here mentioned it, we have a new Coffee with the Counselor series that you'll see some more info go out about. And that's really about uh, fostering discussion within, between the counselors and all of you to give tips and tricks that, um, that we may know and that you're using at home to share with others so that we can help navigate all kinds of sticky parent situations. So I think the next one is about, um, it's called Homework Wars, so talking about how to manage homework. We'll also have um, a presentation on, uh, and a great discussion about technology, so uh, hopefully some interesting topics that you might join us for. All right, questions for me about logistics, yes? Um, do you help them with your Navian accounts and set them up? 
Yeah, we do. We do that about winter of ninth grade. We wait until they've sort of gotten acclimated and found their footing. So I think the ninth grade counselor is scheduled to go in in February and do that with them. And then we do a lesson in the fall of sophomore year, um, hopefully one in the spring. And then junior year, they start using it pretty often, starting in the, in the kind of, we started our first junior seminar actually in December this year, so our kids could get on a little or earlier than they have in the past. Okay, so they're yeah. looking at it and getting used to it. But. Yeah. Yeah. And my other question is, do you really need to have all financial Sorry, planning? we can't hear the questions back here. Sure. So the, the first question was, um, when do we help students get on their Naviance accounts? About halfway through ninth grade. Um, we do a fall, financial aid night fall of grade 12. Um, we invited uh, 11th and 10th grade parents actually to that event this year as well, because sometimes it's helpful to have that info and plan ahead. It's really focused on how to fill out the FAFSA and um, learning a bit about different types of aid awards. It's put on by NIFA and we host it here every October. Okay, so the question was that's for 12th grade, but you're now saying that uh, parents of students are going to invited because that's really too late. Yeah, we, we offered um, this year. Last year we opened it up to 11 and 12, and this year we actually sent out the invite to 10, 11, and 12. Part of it's a space issue um, in that we don't have a space to offer programming to more than 200 and 192. 192 in here. Um, I would love to open it up to everybody, but we also send out, um, the, the same presentation is available um, online through MIFA for folks who can't make it to that night. So we did have some folks, some people that, um, 10th grade and 11th grade parents that got back to us and said that they watched it online because they didn't, they couldn't make it out to the event and they felt like the webinar was pretty good. It's about 45 minutes. So, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, how easy it is to get out of, like, let's say, if my child chose to do honors and let's say uh, beginning of September, he said that he has two weeks to decide if he really was not a good choice for one of those. Mm -hmm. so how easy it is to get out of the choices that they have made now? Um, after the first couple of weeks, it gets tricky. Um, to, to be quite honest, their schedules are really intricate. And so to change one course often means changing multiple courses. Um, it's not usually like, oh, we'll just flip that one. And there's, lucky me, there's another, there's a CP section meeting at the same time. So we really encourage students to choose wisely at this juncture and think about all of those, you know, really important questions about what do they want to be doing and why have they talked to their teacher? Are they ready so that we're not trying to change schedules a month and a half in and it, you know, we have to change five of their classes and they have new teachers. It's just, it's not ideal. So yeah, we, we think the course selection process is really the best time to do that if possible. They will have um, hopefully a walkthrough of their schedule in June of this year so that they can go and meet all of their teachers and, and try out their schedule once before the end of the year. So that helps a little bit too, so they can think over the summer, look at the summer work, and then come in within those first um, few days and make any adjustments that they need. Yeah. Great should question. They have all the re should they have already heard from their teachers on what their recommendation is in all of their classes? So those four that they have to? That's been the request from, from all of us, from our department chairs. I think a lot of folks with the, le the end of the term <coughs> being today, whew, thank goodness, fresh start tomorrow, um, I think that some people will be coming back and revisiting those discussions now that they're not trying to get in that last little project before the term ends. Yeah. You said that the, um, the form to pick the classes yep. is on plus portal. Yes. I'm assuming that's only accessible to the child. Yes. I can't find it on the parent account. Yeah, it's only accessible to the student. So if the student doesn't have this documentation, as a parent, you can't see what they're choosing, right? You cannot. You would need to talk with them, sit down with them, have them open it up for you. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. Unfortunately, it's that's just the way the the system works. Otherwise, it's it gets a little tricky with editing privileges and so. But they they are all able to log in and look at it. If you have questions and you are are hearing, oh, I can't get in. Feel free to email Miss Loshiavo, and she can also take a look and send you a screenshot. And get that done. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, one. You're behind the color, so you can't. Hi there. Yes. I have a couple of, I have a couple of questions. Sure. You 
talked about how the teachers recommend uh, certain classes for math and so forth. Yep. Um, when can parents find out what that recommendation is? Is it after they've already approved what the recommendation is that the child is you know, signed up for it and the parent or the teacher approves it? Is that when parents find out? Yep. Okay. So what if they don't agree with the choice that the teacher has suggested? Then you'll need to talk with that teacher. And, and then they can give you a little more information that we have an appeal process okay. if that needs to happen. And how much time is there between when the teacher says this is what this is what's approved and we can switch it? How much time is there? We're hoping it can happen relatively quickly, but we haven't done it quite like this before, so we don't know exactly, you know, are we talking a few little tweaks? Are we talking total overhaul? Lots more conversation, so I think it will depend. I know that's not necessarily a helpful answer yet, but we haven't lived it this way yet. Okay. Yeah. And was there a second piece of that? No, uh, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out. Wrap my head around. Yeah. So if you think about like back when, or back when I registered for high school classes, like I checked off what I wanted on my little paper form, and then I walked up to people and said, "Will you sign my form?" Right. So that's what we're going back to, as opposed to teachers putting in recommendations in December that they're really not sure about. Right. So we're hoping that this will help students um, choose, their choose their classes and have some voice in it and say, hey, I think I want honors. Is that okay? As opposed to the other way around. I get that. I'm yeah. just wondering if there, you know, there's, um, like, I know what my child's aptitude is, but mm -hmm. sometimes um, the teacher in a particular class determines how well or, or how badly yep. he actually <laughs> yes. And if that's a question that you have now, it's perfectly reasonable to reach out now and ask okay. where you think your student should be headed. And, and teachers will be ready to talk about that with you. They will not be surprised by that question. So feel free to, to get in touch with them now if, if you're if you're curious. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So the kids area. Mm -hmm. show what the is no. Yeah, and then the teachers are going to be going through and looking at what the kids have requested, again, based on what they've told the kids. Yeah, yeah. So just trying to understand. So the kids go in yep. to their bus board account, mm -hmm. make requests. Mm -hmm. At some point, the teachers look at that and yes. make recommendations. They will it's be not the other way around, like the teachers aren't recommending to the kids what they should be doing they're doing that they're doing that now so the question in the back is so are teachers making recommendations they're doing that through their classrooms so they're saying to this class of kids hey you're all in math whatever they're in you know you're in this class and so no but they're so that's often the first conversation has been so your choices here in this class based on what we've done Many of you will be looking at either Algebra 2 Honors or Algebra 2 CP. So kind of introducing, in general, what's next in the pathway, because that's what's available to, for the kids to see through um, the program studies. Okay. So talking about that. And then we've also asked teachers to have individual conversations and help kids decide what courses are most appropriate for them based on what the kids are doing in the class. Does that make sense? So there's kind of the, the big picture conversation and then the individual conversation. And so based on individual conversations with their teachers, they're making their course selections. Yes. And then teachers are going back through it and approving making it. recommendations. And approving it. And approving yeah. it. Yeah. And so at what point do we see what the teachers are recommending and approving the kids? So there should, there, I believe there will be a way for you to see what they, what the final recommendation sheet will look like. I'll have to ask the scheduling team since I'm not really involved in the technical side of it. it I think it'll, I believe it'll be through the portal. Yeah. Through the kids account in the, in the portal. So I would go into my child's portal and look at course selections and at some point it's just gonna switch over from course selections to course recommendations. I think it'll, it will just be a list for what they're registered for for next year. But, okay, so they have to actually submit their course request before parents know what the teachers have recommended unless we reach out to each teacher individually and ask. What yes, and then the teachers will be back in touch if there's if there's a mismatch in what the, what the quest or what the, the course that the child has requested. 
they'll, they are being asked to be in touch with the kid and talk about what, why, and then be in touch with families as well. So by the time parents see it, it's going to be a finalized schedule that the kids will already be registered for. It seems like kind of a circular kind it's, of it's process. Not, it's the, the, yeah. the requests. Okay, here, back here. I'm having a really nice thing as well, sorry. Oh, no. Kate, you're doing a great job. This is very confusing stuff, and it's technical, and there's, there, we have a team of schedules on the other side. Basically, the requests are going in, and it's going to create a, a, a huge list for the department chairs. So they're going to have an idea of how many English classes do we need in ninth grade, and how many history classes do we need, how many sections. And it's going to depend upon what the, what the kids request. And, and that's more important. We know how many English classes or English seats we need. Um, it's more for the electives, and it's more important as the kids get older, we stop looking at AP and things. Um, but I, so those, that request list comes up. Then we have a scheduling team that in March, April, and May will actually be creating the master schedule for the school. So we determine how many sections we need for each class, and then the scheduling team does it. So when we're having these conversations in January, and the kids are supposed to put in all their recommendations for February 1st, then the teachers, beginning February 2nd or 3rd, will then go in and approve or not. If they don't approve, then there'll be conversations between home and the, and the students and the teacher to determine what the placement is going to be. That's going to happen through the month of February. There'll be these conversations that are happening. Um, and the scheduling team isn't really going to stop building the master schedule and start, you build a master schedule, then you shuffle the kids into it to create the classes. So that's the technical backside of it. But there'll be a lot of time through the whole month of February and maybe in, even into the beginning of March where these conversations are happening before the master schedule is built. Is that helpful? Thank you very much. That was a very wonderful explanation of how this works. But my question is, I'm trying to figure out where the connection is between a teacher's recommendations informing a decision on which courses to select ahead of time so that this can be kind of you know, what courses should my child be taking? What's your teacher, teacher recommendation? Okay, we're going to make our selection based on those recommendations and then submit them. So I'm just trying to figure out, it, you know, am I just going to keep asking my daughter, you know, what do they recommend for math? What do they recommend for this? Because so far, she's kind of like, oh, you know, not really sure. She knows what her math recommendation is, but beyond that, there hasn't really been a conversation. She scheduled an appointment with her guidance counselor, but that can't happen. In the 29th, right before she has to make these selections. So I'm just trying to figure out, you know, is, is there any kind of a system where we, you know, our decisions are informed by the teachers and by counselors or whoever makes those recommendations before we make those selection decisions? But it sounds like now. So I, I would say to you that that's really great feedback for us because that's feedback that our department chairs can take back to the teachers and say, we're hearing from parents that, that the recommendations aren't clear. I would say that, that and especially for the eighth grade team, because when, you, when the students are in, in ninth and 10th and 11th grade already, and let's say they're in an honors biology class, for the most part, the teacher can stand in front of the biology class, the honors biology class, and say, for the most part, all of you are being recommended for honors chemistry unless we have a conversation about that, that there's some concerns or there's extra recommendations. So the conversation is probably a little bit more direct as the students are older. Um, but this is different, so which is why we're giving the feedback to the department chairs to make sure that we reinforce with the eighth grade teachers that these conversations are happening and they're very clear. So I do appreciate um, you drilling a, a little bit more information from us on that. We will make sure that that, that happens. The other part it, for Plus Portal, so because we're kind of flipping the process on this, as far as last year, the students put in, uh, the teachers put in their recommendations first, um, then the, the students went in and, and they put, checked off what they wanted. Um, we, we wanted to try it out this way, flipping it this, this year because it was more, as Kate was saying, the system that, that we used to use with paper. So the students would sit down with you, and I know we don't have paper anymore, so this is the Plus Portals conversation at home. 
of, oh, wow, here are your options. Check them off like you would a piece of paper. And then the teacher would then, in the old days, they would sign, yes, you take this class. Yes, I approve this class. So it gives the kids a little bit more um, empowerment to say, this is what I want, right? And um, then the teachers can say, mm, I don't know. I'm concerned about that. Um, let's have a conversation with the parent, let's have a conversation with the student. So we're trying, this is a little bit of an experiment this year, we, we are flipping it around, um, and, and we're hoping that it runs smoothly. If it doesn't, please can give us continued feedback. Jess? Um, so, I'm a graduating senior. Um, I like this process better, to be perfectly honest, because it allows, it allows the, the schedule to be student-driven, now, obviously, the, the, the question is, oh, are they just going to take all easy classes, right? No. But, yes. so, Not in the least. <laughs> Not so, my question. All right. So, so, you know, it's really having that conversation and letting them lead and having them say, I want to do harder here, I want to do harder here, um, and then, or less or you know say you know my jamie is he's not a big fan of math you know he's in one of the higher levels of math but he doesn't really care oh yeah so you know i'm not going to push him in that way so i get what you're saying is that there isn't like you'd like to see the recommendation before that before the kids make their selections but i think having the kids make the selections will give them more ownership in what it is they're doing. And I could say that I worry that, and I absolutely understand what you're saying, and if my daughter was in 10th grade, I'd be behind you 100%. But for 6th, 7th, and 8th, she hasn't had to make any decisions. And she's not panicked. I am. You know, I don't know how to help her with this. I don't know. Um, I feel like we're just shoving them in. And I know this isn't the time, but I just need to say this is why we're so anxious about this. Uh, great points. Uh, the other thing I would say, in addition to what Ms. Driver and Ms. Lindsay have said, is uh, you really want to be, uh, I'm sure all of you are, being very proactive with your kids, having conversations with them. Um, and please do reach out to department chairs, please do reach out to teachers too. Um, if you're sitting down with your child and you're discussing should I take this class or should I take that class and you're not really quite sure and you don't have enough information, certainly understandable, send an email to the teacher, send an email to the department chair saying we're discussing these two options. So uh, the more proactive you are now, uh, the more conversations you have with your kids, uh, and encourage them to have conversations with their teachers. We're encouraging our teachers to have conversations with their kids. Uh, the better, better the uh, result. All right, we have about five more minutes for questions. I saw a hand back here, and then we'll come up front. I just want to clarify that when the teachers look at it and they approve or they do not approve, it goes both ways. The child might put themselves higher than they should be, but they might put themselves lower than they should be. Exactly. They will take a look at each student, um, what was requested, and then have conversations after that. And those conversations will happen through the month of February. And, you know, I'm just actually giving positive feedback on, like, my son is a junior, and then I have an eighth grader. I don't remember nearly having the amount of information and the opportunity. I don't know if this is a new process. When my oldest went through it, I don't remember having these forums to be able to sit down and hear from the department chair so that as a parent I can have a conversation with my son going, okay, you know, you've got a, an 85. And I mean, part of me says I shouldn't have any surprises. Based on what I'm seeing on his grades, I'm hopefully guiding him. Like if he tells me he wants to take an AP class and he's got a 79 in the class, then I'm probably not going to recommend him to go there. But I just think this has been great to have this forum to be able to, because it is, it's brand new coming in from eighth grade where pretty much they're, I think it's wonderful that in ninth grade they don't have a lot of decisions they have to make. Most of the core is set for them where they have a little bit of that freedom, like what language you want to take, and then you've got one whole credit that you get to pick. But this has been much more informative than I found first time around. So I think we're definitely headed in the right direction in terms of informing us as parents and helping the kids guide them because it's a whole new thing for them. But I feel more um, prepared than I felt three years ago going through it. So.
Well, thank you for that feedback too. I, you know, I think that what we're all trying to do is get a little better every year, right? And we get better every year when we get feedback from all of you. So I really, I do appreciate your concerns and the department chairs will check in with those eighth grade teachers. We'll get as much support as we can for the students, but never ever hesitate to contact our teachers, to contact our department chairs, Dr. Lewis and myself. Um, we're here for you, and we're educating your children. We have them here every day, and that is really important to us. I'm just gonna close out with one final thought, and that is AMSA is a school of choice. We are a charter school. You choose to send your children here every day. We're grateful for the choices that you make. I, we appreciate your kids, and we appreciate them being part of our community. We also know you have a choice to take them someplace else for ninth grade, and we really don't want you to. We want, you to keep, we want to keep your kids here. And we know there's choices out there. There's private schools, there's ASVAB, there's your sending districts. Um, if you are thinking about that, thinking about taking your, your child someplace else, come talk to us about it. We would be happy to tell you more about what we offer here at AMSA. But we believe that we can educate all children from all backgrounds, all abilities, at a high advanced level. We feel that, that we have the documentation to prove that. We may not have every system down pat. We're a school that's been here for 14 years and we're working on it every day to make this community a better place for all of us. So please, keep your kids here at AMSA. We want them here. And if you're considering something else, please come and talk to us about it because we think we're the best option. So have a great night, everybody.